Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm editor-at-large of The Atlantic Magazine in Washington, D.C., and it's a real honor uh, to be here uh, to discuss the topic, Russia, Old Lenses for a New World. Uh, as we know, as we see happening, Russia uh, has, in just the last several years, emerged as one of the major sculptors of global affairs wherever you look, whether it's in Latin America, whether it's in uh, 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 the Far East, whether it's in the Middle East, I would even dare say the United States. Um, Russia matters uh, today in a big way, and we have a fantastic panel uh, to give some light to what the emerging issues are for Russia, how it, how it, uh, what its dashboard is as it, as it looks at the rest of the world, and how the rest of the world perceives Russia. And then I think the important topic to, to today is, are, do we have biases that are anachronisms today. Are, do, are, they looking, are we looking through old lenses? And with us to discuss this, we have Dr. Sergei Karaganov, who's Dean of the Faculty of International Economics and Foreign Affairs at the National Research University Higher School of Economics. It's a very bland title for a very important man. There's even something known as the Karaganov Doctrine, which we can hopefully get to later. So it's a real honor to have Sergei with us. Paul Saunders is Executive Dire Director of the Center for the National Interest, uh, if I may so, so previously called the Nixon Center, uh, um, one of uh, Washington's leading realist uh, thinkers and writers in foreign policy, very actively published in the National Interest Magazine. And then we have Andrei, Br I was pr pronouncing this, Bustritsky, uh, chairman of the board of the Foundation for Development and Support for the Valdai Discussion Club in Moscow. But that also belies his important role as one of the most important commentators about media in the world today, particularly Russian media. I've really enjoyed reading uh, Andrei's commentary uh, with many of my friends and colleagues about uh, the Russian voice in Washington and, and kind of global uh, media perceptions of Russia. And Timur Makhmudov uh, is Deputy Director of Programs for the Russian International Affairs Council. Uh, he, just in my few minutes with him, I think he sees himself as a serial provocateur uh, who recently helped oversee a fascinating project bringing about 55 Russian pundits to look 100 years into the future and ask what does the world look like in 100 years. So I hope that in this we'll get into some of that. But let me start start with Sergey and, and just ask you to help us answer this question about lenses and whether or not our lenses are foggy uh, or need to be wiped off and started, start over. Sergey? Uh, I think, uh, but before starting uh, to answer your question, uh, I, I would like to join in uh, ebullient praise uh, of the summer. I, uh, I think it's uh, why it's a uh, eye-opening for all of us, uh, especially, by, by the way, from people from the Gulf. I mean, it's one of the, if not the most interesting mm -hmm. uh, uh, conference where it brings, I mean, all kinds of people into this new world, which is becoming global and where we have to think together. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, I was, uh, uh, to the subject, I was very much abused when I uh, learned that I have to speak on uh, old lenses uh, of Russia uh, for a new world. I believe that uh, Russians like myself have a uh, very adequate, uh, and have very adequate and even uh, post-modern post, post uh, lenses uh, through which we view uh, the world. Now, we might uh, be who might be proved to be wrong, but it might be highly likely that those who call uh, such a worldview obsolete are growing irrelevant or oriented towards past to which they cling. One of the orders, I mean, why do, you th why do we think that everything uh, is post postmodern? Because all the orders uh, uh, on which our policies and thinking uh, have been based during the uh, last decades or centuries uh, are collapsing or collapse, uh, have collapsed. First of all, what are these orders? I mean, th and that's why we uh, think in a different way. Uh, first of all, uh, that, uh, we witness uh, the end of the 500 years of domination of Europe than the West. Uh, it was based uh, largely, uh, but not solely, uh, on uh, Western uh, sup uh, military supremacy, uh, from which, I mean, uh, the ability uh, to influence, uh, to impose economic, cultural, political uh, values uh, uh, stemmed. Uh, that uh, uh, <coughs> supremacy ended a few, a few decades ago, but it became obvious only uh, in 2000s, when the United States became, I mean, 
uh, fl uh, flexed its muscles. I mean, build its, uh, tr uh, invested several trillion dollars into its military, and then ingloriously uh, uh, lost political three uh, wars in, in sequence. But that was be uh, happened before. The liberal world order, the hegemony of the U.S., which lasted only for 16 years, from 91 to 2008. Uh, is, has also, is also collapsing, and uh, Russia is playing a role with it. Of course, uh, we are not playing any role in the cracking of the liberal world or economic world order, uh, and we are not even interested in cracking of that world order. But unfortunately, or fortunately, or due to all kind of circumstances which we have discussed, uh, Americans and some other Westerners who build that order, a liberal world economic order, uh, and now, I mean, heading the uh, crusade uh, against it because uh, Americans saw that uh, this order gives equal or better opportunities to others. That's, I mean, and of course we could j joke at, uh, and laugh at Trump, uh, but Trump uh, is not alone. Here, I think he has been joined by a very significant majority, if not of the American public, but of the American elite. Uh, so we witnessed the final collapse of the uh, bipolar order, uh, though it is being, uh, the people are trying to rebuild it uh, in, uh, on, uh, by NATO Russia, reviving NATO, NATO confrontation or confrontation against, uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, along the eastern coast of Russia. But I don't think it will uh, work. Uh, the European sub order uh, is in deep crisis. Uh, of course, we you witness the crisis of suborder of the Middle Eastern suborder, which was imposed by colonial powers and then uh, kept by the United States and the Soviet Union. Now it is also collapsing uh, in front of our eyes. Uh, so uh, I hope, uh, the, and, and the main thing which is happening now is that our hope for the bright, I mean, our common hope for a bright, uh, brilliant, I mean, common order which will be run by world government uh, and transnational and a combination of uh, enlightened transnational corporations and NGOs did not happen. Mm. We instead we have plunged into Westphalian or pre-Westphalian system. Uh, we witness re-anesthetization of international relations, but of course uh, in a globalized on the globalized level and with global problems. Uh, so, uh, so uh, uh, this uh, uh, current order of disorder is transitional. Mm. Uh, it will, uh, it, we aimed at it, saying, I mean, I mean, Russians, Chinese wanted multipolarity. What we got is chaos, and it's transitional. Uh, if we do not uh, encounter uh, or slip into a big war, nuclear war, that will be something else. So, and that is uh, maybe, maybe there will be, as we predict, something like uh, uh, two suborder, big suborders, one um, uh, larger Eurasia led by China but balanced by others, including Russia, and uh, Middle will be there, and the United States led smaller world order. Uh, of course, it, they will not be close to each other, but they will be, there will be two centers, maybe. Uh, but anyway, uh, Russia, and people like myself in Russia believe that we are at the beginning of the new world order. We have to build up our credibility and instruments to play an active role in the building of the new order, or that new order will be built upon us, which has happened I mean, a couple of times in history, and we are not interested in uh, this. And that is on this background, uh, you could read Russian uh, Middle Eastern polls, and including policy to the Gulf. Uh, so. Uh, or wh what are the aims? Uh, first is to build up, as I've said, uh, credibility and muscles. Uh, se second, to keep uh, radicalism as far, and radicals as far from our borders as possible. Uh, third, to train this military force and increase its deterrent capacity uh, so that others would not dare to uh, uh, use massively its military force like uh, they did uh, when Russia uh, was weak. Uh, we all remember the 78 the bombing of uh, Yugoslavia, uh, Iraqi, etc. 
uh, and so the, uh, the other aim is to stop the irresponsible uh, and mindless practice of color revolutions which bring disaster to areas, huge areas of the world. Uh, how should we deal with that? First, by showing, uh, that, uh, by showing that we could do things, and we have showed that in Syria. Mm -hmm. Second, supporting of sovereignty and existing regimes, notwithstanding the ideology or, or practices. Uh, uh, third, to, to support of traditional values uh, and the society, and when they believe that the societies should involve according to their own uh, uh, rhythm and speed. Uh, not taking sides uh, in their religious, uh, secular, or, in, or uh, interstate affairs. We, have, we are keeping our, our out of, of Middle Eastern quarrels understanding that you have them, uh, but we would rather be out of them uh, and uh, play an intermediary role if we are asked, or right. as a balancer right. if we are not asked. So far, uh, this strategy has proved to be extremely effective. Cheap, economically mm -hmm. beneficial, uh, politically too. Uh, this strategy is difficult because you, you have to use a lot of your brains and a lot of competence, I mean, to maneuver like that. Uh, but I think that Russia is not willing and not uh, uh, to fill the that so-called vacuums as it is being accused. I mean, our American friends, I mean, uh, got into, now they're trying to get out and creating a vacuum. No, thank you, we're not going to fill your vacuum. We have tried already a couple of times in the, in the, when we were Soviets. Right. Not anymore. Sergey, can I ask you a question? I want to jump to Timur who's on the international side yeah. and then go to Andre and then, and then Paul, but, but to um, just ask you to go deeper. In, in, in Russia's past history, activities in Afghanistan became huge risks, huge price paid, and, and, and came back. And, and what I've been interested in it, listening to you as you talk about um, Russia's moves and the way it's looking at things, particularly the Middle East. Some of us on the outside say, wow, Russia uh, really uh, went deep in Syria and it looks like it's paying off for you. Uh, Russia has relations with Iran and Syria that make countries like Saudi Arabia frustrated and uncomfortable. Um, and you see Russia engaged in some activities, building new relations with Egypt and um, also engaged in the Libya mess to some degree. So I'm interested as you look at it as a critic not representing the Russian government, but just looking as an analyst, what are the blind spots Russia may have today? What are the risks you think Russia may take that might not worth be taking? I mean, no country is perfect. America has lots of blind spots and it's in a lot of messes. Where is Russia screwing up or possibly screwing up? Uh, well, we have uh, a lot of possibilities of screwing up and uh, you have mentioned some of them which we did already. And that is deep involvement in any crisis. Mm. Uh, and uh, and we're, But we're doing it light. Even in Syria, uh, it has been a, a huge military exercise. And by the way, the price was of a huge military exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, with some light uh, special forces on the ground, but mostly uh, air, air force and, uh, and missiles, etc., etc. By the way, which was which from which we showed not only uh, the local guys what we could do, but uh, the big guys because the cruise missiles which were fired at 2,000 kilometers, I mean, were not aimed at bandits on the ground. I mean, mm. we, we all understand that it's a waste of money. I mean. Uh, but uh, it is. A, we are fully aware that we should not get into the, into any of the crises. We could help and then refrain. But we, are, we have a good or excellent relations with all major Middle Eastern powers. We have excellent relations with, with. There are difficulties. We have excellent relations with Israel. We have very good relations with Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have on a uh, scale of one to ten, where you put your relations with Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia seven, seven, uh, and Iran, uh, Iran seven, eight, mm. uh, Israel nine. Mm. Uh, so I mean, uh, then other other uh, Egypt nine uh, to ten. Uh, so with this kind of a, uh, maneuvering, uh, if you are competent uh, and cautious, you could only win. Mm. Timur, I'd like to get your future perspective in addressing this question about whether our lenses are out of date or more specifically, whether Russia's lenses are out of date. Thank you for 
this uh, question, but before I start answering, I would like to thank Dr. Ibtisam Atkedbi for organizing this wonderful event. I know everyone fears her and wants to tip the hat, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, probably it's a part of the tradition of the region. Uh, if you could speak a little more closely yeah. to the mic. Um, so your question is very uh, useful for understanding what's going on in the region and Russia's involvement into the region. I mean, the risks of Russia. Um, I think that um, if we take um, Russia's, Russia's activity over the last two or three, four years in the Middle East, we can witness that um, from the tactical point of view, uh, Russia um, is very effective. We have. Um, quite good relations, as you've mentioned, uh, with the major actors in the region on bilateral uh, level, uh, even with, with uh, Turkey. Uh, you mentioned Saudi Arabia, uh, but uh, the Soviet Union was the first country to recognize Saudi Arabia as an independent state, and up to the late uh, 30s, uh, uh, the Soviet ambassador um, Karim Hakimov was very welcomed by the family of the king. So we have uh, very um, good history with the region. What are the risks of today is that um, by accomplishing uh, on a very good level tactical tasks, uh, we can face problems in, on a strategic level. So we, if you have good relations with, uh, I mean, Russia, uh, good relations with Israel, with Egypt, with Turkey, with Saudi Arabia, with Iran, uh, with the United Arab Emirates, etc. But if you put all this into one bottle, you will have a lot of troubles. And that is why we cannot uh, answer clearly to the question, what is the Russia's strategy in the region? This is the same for, for other great powers, for uh, United States, for United Kingdom, uh, for France, or, or whatever you, you, you mentioned. Because it's quite difficult to combine. If we, even if you have uh, good bilateral relations, it is very difficult to have uh, three, four, five partners uh, sitting around one table. So this is one risk. The second um, is um, uh, Russia's involvement into the uh, Syrian affairs uh, and military operation. And today there is a feeling that Russia will take all uh, the cost for reconstruction in the region. But according to the last um, estimates, and I take it from the foreign uh, policy and one of uh, the articles, it's up to three. 150 billion dollars, the, the cost of reconstruction. Uh, of course, it's, it's, the price is very high, and that is why during his speech, the President Putin in mid of October, um, he addressed the uh, Interparliamentary Assembly. He also addressed to international community asking for uh, joining uh, Russia um, to reconstruct uh, Syria. And today there is a debate over this topic, and you can follow it in, in I'm going to ask Washington you to speak Post. a little more loudly. Yeah, in, yeah. you can follow it uh, in Washington Post, Washington Post, in foreign policy. I, I mentioned this uh, because it is in English, and uh, of course many of articles and expertise in Russian as well. But uh, the answer to this and the challenge for Russia here is uh, joint work uh, with uh, major partners, opponents or whatever in the region and of course uh, yesterday we heard about the growing um, interest of uh, regional players uh, to play their role in the region of course we cannot uh, do this without uh, Saudi Arabia without uh, Turkey uh, Egypt uh, and uh, we don't hear uh, much about Israel but it is also a very important uh, player in the region. So the Russia's risk, right. the second risk is uh, to have uh, talks, negotiations, discussions over this topic, re reconstruction yeah. in, in the region, specifically in Syria. So Timur, not to over, I'm, I'm going to be grossly uh, inadequate in, in reframing your comments for a minute, but, but I think what you're basically saying is Russia's in a good place with just about everybody. But let me ask you to respond. Um, I'm interested in what drives countries' behavior, what drives them to deploy power, what drives them to carve out relationships where one nation is more important than another nation. So I'm going to ask you to reply in part to this Sergei Karaganov quote. 
that I found was very interesting. He said, the West has constantly sought to expand its zone of military, economic, and political influence through NATO and the EU. Russian interests and objectives were flatly ignored. Russia was treated like a defeated power, though we did not see ourselves as defeated. Uh, as uh, as a, a, a softer version of the Treaty of Versailles was imposed on the country. Now, you may agree or disagree with our friend Sergei here, but I'm interested in the fact that that, that the issues that we're talking about are not static. That what, why we're talking about Russia today is it seems to be more robust, it seems to be more active and, and agitated and active. Uh, the issues with Ukraine uh, uh, are on the table. Syria, of course, um, a, a brinksmanship with Russia, concerns about you know, a variety of these issues. So I just want to get your feeling, because I think one of the reasons we're trying to understand is what is driving Russia's view of things today, what matters and what doesn't matter, given the way it used to operate in the past? Well, it's for the second time uh, during these debates uh, Ukraine is mentioned, uh, um, I've noticed, but uh, it is also a very um, uh, important uh, question you've asked about the drivers of Russia's activity in the international arena. I think here we should pay strong attention to, um, to uh, new rules for the new world order. So if we discuss new uh, world order during this panel, we should um, also discuss possibilities to uh, have uh, discussions over new uh, rules. And here Russia is a, an important uh, player and uh, Russia has its own vision. Uh, by saying uh, rules, I mean, first of all, international law. And uh, I see that uh, this is the, one of the principal challenges uh, of today on the international arena. Um, I have a feeling that uh, leaders of great powers, they try not to discuss uh, international law because there are different perceptions of this, there are dis different approaches. Uh, Russian vi uh, vision is um, the, the principal um, object objectives and the drivers, if you want, is uh, uh, is non-interference into the domestic policy, uh, first of all, and um, uh, it, it can be uh, understood differently, but I mean, by Russia and it is uh, Western partners, uh, but uh, it is important uh, to mention this. And also the political and diplomatic approach in conflict resolution although it is discussable and can be perceived differently. But these are two main points that Russia wants to keep. And I think we need uh, um, a global discussion, if you want, over, this, uh, over these issues and over rules over international law. And here Russia plays uh, a key role. Uh, if, if you follow uh, the discussion in, in uh, the United Nations and Security Council, um, so you, you will see that uh, Russia gives a lot of initiatives on that. Um, even not supported by its partners. Thank you very much. Now, Andre, I want to read something that you said. I love, I love, is this the Valdai uh, Club, and I love what you're, you're doing. And one time, you were hanging out in Washington, D.C. with Angela Stent and with a lot of uh, 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 people, and you, you were sort of talking about the launch of, I think, a Rus the Russian voice or the voice of Russia in the United States. It was fascinating. And I just want to transport us back in time, because I think this came back, and you, you had said, our opposing perspectives and interests have matured over time into mutual respect for differences based on geopolitical interests rather than ideologies similar to that of the United States and France, where two partners came to the table with different perspectives uh, and with an understanding of <coughs> historical and cultural differences. Our panel discussion did not gloss over the fact that our two countries have different cultural and political approaches. However, our focus was on how best to prevent the Russian perspective to an American audience and hopefully to reach a large audience through online streaming options. The goal of the discussion was not to persuade as much as to provide context for understanding the audience. I find this fascinating because you're talking about Russian media in the United States, the Russian voice in the United States, and that rather than having opponents, you had friends in America that were helping this to happen. What happened? Uh, I, I'm not sure in my microphone. It works? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, our conversation reminds me um, old joke about German tourists in Great Britain. Uh, it was 
this joke was popular after um, Second World War. German tourist uh, was arriving at the passport control, and custom officer uh, was asking him, uh, for instance, about the uh, 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 purpose of your visit, the length of your stay, and um, finally, our officer uh, answered him, asked him, uh, what is your occupation, German tourist? No, no occupation, just tourism. <laughs> uh, just tourism, I can repeat. Uh, just tourism. Uh, it seems to me we overestimate today conflicts. Mm. Uh, we overestimate the situation. It, it, I absolutely agree. Uh, we, we can see new world order, emerging, emerging of new world order. It's true. Uh, we have uh, some problems with international security. But probably I would like to know who against international security. Of course, the question is uh, in understanding of international security. But um, uh, of course, if, if you know some actors uh, who are against international security, we should ask a uh, question about what uh, we will see after the finish of today's international security. New one. I hope so. And, um, uh, and uh, at the same time, you, uh, you have asked my colleagues about drivers uh, of Russian policy. Uh, it seems to me there is a very important drivers of Russian policy. First of all, we can see now in Russia creation of new political civil nation. It's Say first again, new political civil, uh, civil nation. Mm -hmm. New political nation, because, um, or if you like, a uh, civil society. Uh, because it's first time. Uh, in 1917, uh, uh, this attempt uh, failed, uh, and uh, Stalin dictatorship. Uh, in, uh, after, after Stalin's death, in, in so-called so, uh, it was unsuccessful. Now we have a real opportunity to, um, uh, to see successful final uh, of this process. It, and it, it's very important. Uh, uh, now, uh, first generation of Russian people who, was, who have formed after Soviet Union uh, uh, came to uh, wealth and power. 40% um, of Russian core of, uh, uh, of, uh, of core of Russian governors uh, new people, 40%. Uh, Russian uh, minister of uh, finance minister, Areshkin, mm -hmm. he has never been pioneer or member of Komsom. Uh, Russian minister of communication um, has, um, uh, uh, he, he, he did the Soviet university. Uh, absolutely fresh and new people. And this new generation is looking for its position in this world. Right. When we speak about world order, world order, uh, uh, of course, it's, it's very good to have world order, but uh, we need uh, world order for our own place in this world order. And, uh, uh, and, and the Russian elite is new elite, is, uh, is trying to find this place, this position to, to mark some details. Middle East is a sort of uh, testing ground for a lot of world process. And it's, from my point of view, it's extremely important to, to, uh, to try to reach um, uh, success here, uh, to elaborate methods of cooperation and, and uh, collaboration between Russia and the United States. <coughs> of course, there are a lot of serious problems uh, inside our countries, in the Middle East, because uh, never uh, before uh, have people uh, uh, so involved in uh, world policy mm. due to communication. Uh, billions of people uh, are involved in communications. And we can see a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, intellectual waste and debris in this internet space. It's true. But, of course, uh, well, but, but what uh, are we waiting for? It's, it's normal. It's, it's a very serious, uh, uh, it's a very serious situation, and it's a very complex process because new technologies, uh, especially communications, and so on and so on. Uh, and um, uh, uh, for instance, uh, I think that 
you know, a lot of, a lot of mutual accusation in interference, I think meddling and actions and so on. Okay, now probably uh, it's unavoidable because due to due new communications, due a lot of actors on, on, the, on the world scene. Okay, we, can, we must elaborate a rules of meddling, a rules of interference. Maybe. Who, who's, going to, who's going to announce or establish those rules? You know, as I think about it and I'm listening to you talk about this world that's evolving in media and communications, and again, I'm going to leave it to Paul to, to, to complain about Russia's excellent skill at hacking and bots and communication, but, but you know, when you look at what Russia has seemed to have mastered, is perceived to have done and mastered in communications in very new hybrid ways, not only in dealing with the US, but dealing with the Europe, I don't know, maybe dealing with uh, some in the Middle East. When you talk about new rules being established, one of the things I'm interested in is whether Russia wants to be part of that new rulemaking business, because you know, Russia was sort of moved out of the G8. It was, there's been international reaction to some of Russian behavior. Now that can be a good thing if Russia is in fact going to put together a new assembly of rule makers. It can be a bad thing if it's being left out of the rule making club. And so I'm interested in these areas of media and communications where you say we need new rules. I'm interested in how you see them evolving. Who's going to do it? Will Russia be the rule maker or the rule to, to try to initiate a, a, a new consensus, if you will? Because I do see it as one of the huge new frontiers of conflict today. I agree. I agree. It's a serious problem uh, because um, uh, uh, in, um, uh, in, in Soviet time, situation was bad, but not 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 so bad because right. because uh, uh, because uh, uh, Soviet uh, socialist countries and capitalist countries they uh, uh, both camps uh, had the same. Uh, picture the same understanding of future. The argument was about uh, about how can we reach this future. But human rights, uh, 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 healthy, wealthy, and, uh, prosperity, and, and mm. so on. Uh, okay, um, especially in what? Mm. But uh, what is the reality? But now we uh, have not common narrative. We have not common understanding of future. Right. It, it's, it's a main problem. If we speak about rules, about frontiers, about yeah. understanding, we need uh, to understand for what. Okay, we, uh, uh, if, if, if we must create new world uh, order, uh, for what? Need world, uh, world order is, is a tool, is instrument. It is not purpose of our world right. order. It's, we are not in jail and in prison. Um, uh, we, we should, first of all, we should uh, to indicate, uh, to discover uh, most important elements, features of future, what we need. Sergey and Timur, I had two quick two finger reactions, and then I'm going to go to Paul. Sergey? Um, yes, Russia wants to be uh, the rule maker together with others. Uh, previous rules were made by others. Uh, in the uh, field of uh, information and cyber, um, a few years ago, actually 10, 15 years ago, China and Russia proposed uh, a regulation of the cyber field. Uh, Americans uh, did not, uh, were rejected because they thought that they would keep uh, preponderance there. So what we are now, I mean, Americans are tearing, uh, I'm happy I don't have any hair, the hair because, I mean, uh, <laughs> social media has gone out of control in their own country and yeah. they don't know how to control it now anymore and it's one of the reasons of your revolution. But in addition to that, I mean, we have a far more, a far deeper question, and that is, we have cyber weapons. It may be that, I mean, countries already have uh, cyber weapons of mass destruction. They are the cheapest uh, weapons of mass destruction, and we have no control of them all. So hopefully, this particular debate when we are, uh, Russians are uh, uh, accused of interfering through cyberspace into American affairs, I hope one percent of that is true, because otherwise, I mean, my pride would have been hurt if it is less than that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but we shall speak seriously together. Excellent, Timur. About uh, Russia's possibility to establish new rules reminds me of the discussion on new bipolarism. 
so if uh, some time ago we have two poles, today uh, at least we need to define what's the mainstream, what's the, the, pole, the pole that exists. Once we define this, then we can uh, think of uh, Russia or Russia plus some other states or some other emerging powers that could uh, elaborate on, the, on this topic. But this will be possible if we can define what's the mainstream. And here we have a lot of problems as well. Now, Paul, I'm not going to ask you to tell us what Moscow's lenses are, but I'm going to put the burden on you of representing the rest of the world's lenses about Russia. Uh, are they obsolete? Well, uh, I, I'm not really sure that I'm qualified to represent the rest of the world. I'll, I'll try... A uh, modest American. May, maybe to uh, uh, offer some opinions on the country that I live in. Uh, but, but before I do that, I, I should, like everyone else, uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Alketbi and, of course, the Emirates Policy Center for a really terrific uh, conference. Uh, and, and before I respond to the question about the lenses, uh, let me perhaps respond briefly to some of the discussion uh, that, as long that, as you that get we've to my had question. so far. I, yeah. I absolutely yeah. will. I, I absolutely will. Uh, the first thing I would say, I, I guess, is to remember one of my favorite, if not my favorite, uh, American writers, Mark Twain. Uh, and some uh, who read American literature may be familiar with Mark Twain's uh, statement uh, that the reports of his death uh, were, were exaggerated. Uh, and I, I think that's my uh, broad uh, response to some of what has been said about the international order, and I'd be the first to admit uh, that it is facing strains. And actually, I'd be the first to admit that the best way to stabilize it is by making it somewhat more inclusive. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, I, I don't think it's collapsed. Uh, I don't think it's about to collapse. Uh, and I don't think the, the, while the West is uh, 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 facing some real questions uh, and, and questioning its own uh, confidence and ability to manage the international system, I don't think the West has uh, uh, withdrawn from, from trying to do that. Uh, the second thing I would say about the world order is perhaps to reflect on uh, American foreign policy uh, over the last couple of decades, and I think that one of the things that uh, we have learned looking at the, the country level in the international system is, you know, be careful about breaking things uh, if you don't have uh, a good plan credibly and quickly uh, to establish a new order. So uh, I would urge uh, a degree of caution uh, for those who may be less than satisfied uh, with uh, the current international system. Uh, then, uh, turning to this question uh, of the lenses, and I'll talk uh, I'll, uh, about how I think the U.S. establishment uh, looks at, at Russia, and then a little bit about how I think the president uh, looks at Russia, because I think the president uses different lenses uh, than the American establishment uh, in looking at Russia. Uh, thinking about our establishment uh, in Washington, I, I think there are four uh, main lenses from my point of view uh, through which uh, uh, the U.S. establishment tends to see Russia. Uh, particularly with a focus on the Middle East, uh, since that's where we are and what we're talking about. Uh, one certainly uh, is the war in Syria and, and Russia's role there. Uh, and from the perspective of the U.S. establishment, I, I think that demonstrates a, 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 a Russian uh, support for a, a very brutal uh, Assad uh, government. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, most Americans uh, would, would really not be uh, prepared to support. Uh, the, the second lens uh, is the lens of Iran, and we've had a, and, and Russia's relationship with Iran, and we've talked uh, a lot about Iran uh, so far over the last couple of days. I, I think uh, the American uh, establishment in general shares many of the concerns and, and reservations about Iran that have been expressed. 
uh, looking specifically at Russia, uh, you know, certainly a, a major uh, arms relationship uh, between uh, Russia and Iran. Uh, that uh, some of uh, America's allies in this region find very troubling, and we certainly pay attention to those uh, views. Uh, then I, I think a lot of Americans, uh, uh, and particularly in the establishment, you know, look back at uh, Russia's, uh, so certainly Russia eventually uh, cooperated with the United States and others in the end in bringing about the, the nuclear agreement uh, but I think for, for many in the establishment uh, who uh, have a long memory on such matters, uh, they, they remember Russia kind of slowing down and obstructing uh, efforts uh, to sanction Iran and to apply greater pressure to Iran and uh, ultimately to, to perhaps to use some of the president's language uh, resulting in getting a, a, a bad deal rather than a good deal uh, in the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, the, the third uh, lens, which is uh, outside of this region, is Ukraine. Uh, and Ukraine, I think, is important for the U.S. establishment in thinking about Russia for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is uh, a question of uh, rules and norms, and there's a widespread uh, view in the United States, particularly in the establishment, that Russia's uh, conduct in Ukraine uh, violates uh, widely held rules and norms. Uh, the, the second point I, I think that's quite important is uh, uh, in understanding the establishment perspective toward Russia is uh, Russia's uh, denials of its involvement uh, in eastern Ukraine, uh, which uh, 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 people in the, the Washington establishment don't really believe. Uh, and that contributes to uh, a, a significant uh, trust uh, problem uh, from the perspective of the U.S. establishment uh, in Except looking at president Russia. Trump. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll get to the yeah. president in, in just a minute. Uh, and then, you know, the, the last lens uh, is, is this question of the, uh, the election interference. Uh, and uh, that certainly is also uh, a very important one, and it, it uh, I think, for our establishment, creates a, a new kind of threat uh, from Russia that uh, most in the establishment had not really uh, considered previously. Now, the president, I, I think, has a very different uh, set of, of lenses, and I would point to, to three there. Uh, one, I think, is the lens of uh, a former business person who is much more interested in uh, uh, what uh, he thinks he may be, be able to accomplish than in some of these, uh, uh, let's call them more theoretical ideas or more abstract ideas uh, about uh, rules and norms. He's interested in, you know, what can I do uh, together uh, with Russian President Putin? Right. Uh, I, I think the second lens that the president applies is what I would call a, a, a national interest lens. And he's certainly got his own view of what American national interests are, and that's a topic of robust uh, debate inside the United States. But, you know, uh, applying his America first uh, frame uh, to the question of America's national interests, I think uh, that's, uh, that's the second one. You know, and the, the third lens, and this one I think is a particularly interesting one because we were talking at the beginning about to what extent are the lenses out of date. But, you know, as I look at the president and some of the things that he says about uh, Russia and the way that he seems to want to interact with Russia, Actually, I, I think that he looks at Russia through the lens of a U.S.-Soviet relationship uh, in a way that uh, most people in the United States no longer do. Mm. Uh, and I think that what, what I mean by that is that I think the president looks at Russia as uh, one of America's most important partners in the world, and he looks at that relationship as a relationship that the United States really has to get right. And negotiations with Moscow as kind of a, a, 
a pinnacle of, of what one can achieve uh, in, in international negotiation. Uh, and I, I think that lens, interestingly enough, I think is, uh, at least from my perception, one that actually rather helps him with our Russian partners. Uh, because I, I think it leads the president to mm -hmm. give Moscow a level of attention and respect uh, right. that, that it hasn't really received uh, uh, in recent years from Washington. If I were live tweeting this, Paul, I would have tweeted that comment. That's a most very interesting uh, <laughs> comment. And I want to tell you, you're all allowed 280 characters on Twitter now uh, uh, if right. you want to spell right. out uh, uh, you know, long form. That thought. <laughs> let, let me just uh, ask, I'm gonna ask uh, e each of you very, very briefly, because I wanna go to the audience um, right away, but, but as I think about power in the world, and I think about what we're really talking about, what's coming down the future in lenses, it's how we see ourselves. And, and, and Paul, I guess I had a visceral, almost negative reaction to your first statement about, hey, you know, Mark Twain said we're not out of the game, but when it comes to power, power is like the stock market. Mm -hmm. You know, stock market is based on future expectations. And one of the interesting things when you look at Russia, you look at the United States, you look at China, you look at Saudi Arabia, you look at Iran, part of what we're doing, you look at the UAE, part of the question what everybody's trying to game is how to get their future expectations up. China, clearly up. The United States clearly not necessarily up. Mm -hmm. Russia seems to be changing its game. And one of the questions we're asking today, which Americans are struggling with, maybe other people around the world are, is Russia upping its game so much that it's going to play a much more significant role in the future than it is today? And is Saudi Arabia, with the things we see going on in, inside its country, which, which many people are reacting to, wow, it's, you know, today if you look on the front page of The National, it very bluntly says Saudi Arabia is planning a rock proxy war in Lebanon against Iran. I mean, it's sort of an interesting thing that when you look at, does that help Saudi Arabia down the road? Maybe it does, actually, when you look at Saudi Arabia 20 years from, from now, as opposed to a more stagnant, uh, frozen country before. So I, I just want to ask each of you, as you think about uh, this region, you think about some of the other major global players in the world, and you think 20 years ahead, are the games that Russia playing moving towards that end? And, and you know, I see the United States today, I've been very uh, public about it, is in some kind of strategic contraction. So there's a lot of doubt about the weight of America's, and not that it won't be important, but it's not gonna be as important. And so let me just tell you, the stock of General Electric is plummeting, the company. <laughs> plummeting, $19 a share used to be 40, you know, lost $180 billion of shareholder value in the last year. Is GE that different a company than one year ago? Maybe, maybe not, but it's based on the fact that people don't think it's going to be as great a company anymore. So America's stock is, I think, down near General Electric's. And the question is, uh, is Russia's stock where, say, uh, I don't know, Google is or something? Sergey? Well, of course, uh, uh, Ra Ra Russia's stock is where the Google is, is clear. Uh, we have played the... You do, the, you, you say it is clear it is. Yes, it is clear it yeah. is. Uh, That's the, another the, the question moment. is whether we will be able to uh, keep up. It's a big question uh, for us all. We do not know because we clearly hit uh, beyond our base, uh, beyond our base, but we uh, were using the competitive advantages which we have. I mean, and uh, Google is not exactly, uh, for example, I mean, right. it, it doesn't have a, a lot of material things, but we're also using it, mostly material things. Right. First, mm -hmm. second, nothing is predictable. Technology will change the world. And mm -hmm. if we believe that technology will change the world in this way, we are absolutely sure we are wrong. We don't know. We are going, getting into the predictable and predictable world. So the game is, uh, to, uh, it is a constant game. Mm. You have to be prepared for the constant game. It is, nothing is eternal. I mean, it might be that seven years from now, Russia and the United States will have a very robust and, and close relationship. I would say to that. The best thing is to have a close, a robust relationship for us with China, and the United States. If mm. that is done, we are, we're, and we are sitting where we are sitting, as a great Eurasian power balancing everybody else, we are fine. And that is possible. But for that, you have to, uh, to play a constant game. Andre? Short form. 
Short point. Uh, first of all, you mentioned so many lessons that we should uh, try to build telescope or spyglass <laughs> uh, and to, to research our common future. Um, honestly, I, I don't know direct and, and uh, clear answer on the question. Mm. Timur? Well, um, uh, I think that with these lenses we should uh, build a microscope, not a telescope. Why? I, I, I could um, answer you briefly. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Karaganov uh, that technology will matter a lot uh, and we should think over the common issues uh, for common projects among great powers and all those who can join uh, this discussion. One of these issues is nuclear issue. What will be in the future, the nearest future with that? I mean, not only uh, with the, the official uh, nuclear powers, but with all those who are seeking to uh, get access to all these technologies. So this is one of the issues. Uh, right. Ecology is uh, the other. It's a huge topic. And uh, the Paris Agreement uh, is, can be a driver for future discussion. Uh, we can name a couple of, of more issues right. to, to that. But we should think uh, on, on, on um, projects of, common, of cooperation. Thank challenging you. projects. And Paul, since I challenge you with my stock market uh, metaphor, um, I give you a chance back to knock me back. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I don't fundamentally disagree, Steve, with, with what you said. I think power is uh, very substantially about perception and expectations. Uh, what I would say about the United States is uh, 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 strong fundamentals, uh, n n not always effectively uh, deployed and uh, uh, General uh, Electric. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and certainly in Russia's case, I think relatively uh, a, a weaker hand and and quite well played. And there there's some questions uh, about how long Russia can continue to play its hand uh, extremely well. Uh, I think there are uh, questions about right. how long it takes the U.S. to get its uh, act together. Excellent. We're going to go to the audience now, and I want to tell all of the employees of General Electric that are in the audience I'm happy to meet uh, outside right after. So, um, uh, Oda Aberdeen. Oh, there you are. Steve and Paul, do you think Trump can finish the war in Syria? Can they reach an agreement that will restore the integrity of Syria, peace in Lebanon, and Iraq, and then to our Russian experts. I was in a conference in Marrakesh, and uh, a Russian participant said, Trump is a lame rabbit. Do you agree with that assessment? Trump is a what? A, a lame rabbit rather than a lame duck. Oh, oh a lame rabbit. Uh, so I guess, Paul, would you like to respond to the question on Syria and Lebanon and the broad uh, tectonics of the Middle East, can Trump and the United States play any kind of constructive role? You know, I, I guess on Syria, I would say uh, a couple of things. You know, the, the first is that the administration uh, has established already a certain tension between its Iran policy and its Syria policy. And I, I think that's something that they have to reflect on uh, a, a little bit uh, to the extent that they really want to participate in some kind of resolution uh, of the conflict in Syria. A at the same time, you know, so far uh, the, the administration has essentially taken a position uh, and European governments too that uh, we're not going to pay for reconstruction of a Syria that's led by Mr. Assad. Uh, and, and thrown that problem uh, into the lap of uh, our, our Russian counterparts. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. I would just quickly say, since you asked me as well, I, I don't know the answer. I would just simply say that there are a lot of ways in which we frame the Syria conflict which are highly inadequate given the complexity. I worry a lot about the Kurds. I worry about their expectations inside Syria. I worry how they may work uh, with either the Russians in the equation or, or inside Syria, inside Iraq. And, and this is really the 900-pound gorilla that no one in the media is talking about, but, but fundamentally how you get back to this. So, so you can come up with any sort of solution if you leave the Kurds 
out of the question. But when you begin looking at uh, uh, the expectations, particularly that the United States helped set up with the Kurds uh, and what they were fighting for. I think it's very complicated. I think the Russians are dealing with the same thing. And it related, so, so I don't believe there are any easy solutions uh, that can be cooked up. But Sergey, on, uh, on either this question on Syria and the broad Middle East with, with, with Russia, uh, or this question about Trump being a lame rabbit, which I hadn't <laughs> seen, but uh, whatever that might mean and whatever comment you'd like to make. Just yeah. one moment. Yeah. Um, uh, I can't stop thinking uh, stop to think about lame uh, uh, rabbit and what kind of adventures make the rabbit lame. Yeah. What's happened? It's, it's, it's a very interesting question. Maybe more yeah, interesting we may have to have to discuss, about discuss that over coffee after. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, uh, as all kind of words which are directed at uh, American president, uh, we are sort of score conservative power, Russia. Mm. So we respect uh, the presence of other countries. Uh, all the more that we are uh, looking for, uh, looking uh, ahead, and it might be that in a right. few years he will be again the president of the mm -hmm. same country. So the lame ra I'll leave the lame rabbit with you. Great. Yeah. Let me jump to the next question. Rashid Al Kabi. Uh, yes, uh, let me first start by thanking wave, wave you. Wave at us so I see where you are. There you are. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. No, this way, oh. please. I'm here. Oh, oh, you're, oh there yeah. you Okay. Let me uh, first of all thank the, uh, the panel for the very informative session. Uh, my question is let's say that the U.S. actually rebalances its strategy in Asia and decided to disengage from a very notable, let's say, areas such as Afghanistan and Iraq. Would we see Russia actually taking advantage of that and establishing what we call is a new order in the region? Mm. Sergey, I'm going to ask you, you and Timor to answer this. And, and, I, and I'm going to piggyback on Rashid's great question and say, Will Russia take advantage of it? And if Russia isn't, would China take advantage? I mean, what's China? Because China's also been, if, if that's okay with Russia, to uh, piggyback on his great question. Uh, uh, the Chinese are afraid of getting there, even with, uh, uh, with economic means, because they do not understand their, uh, the region all too well. I mean, they are gradually moving in, hopefully to rebuild eventually over the years to maybe to participate in the rebuilding of Iraq right. and Syria. Uh, whether Russia will jump in and or, uh, if and uh, United States disengage, no, thank you. I mean, it's not, uh, I mean, uh, we would rather have Americans, I mean, stick there, I mean, for uh, eternity than pay for that. I mean, because uh, they, uh, their investment uh, has been, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, uh, have been uh, getting negative uh, results for quite some time. Uh, that's why they were drawing. The problem, but the real big question is, of course, that the local forces, including people here, have to take uh, responsibility for their lives now and for their futures. So just to be clear, you think Russia's interests are that the United States remain engaged uh, no, no, in I'm, Afghanistan and Jokingly, because I don't think they will. Because ah. So it will, it will have been I mean, too stupid even for our friends in the United States to say, uh, our, I think that local people, local forces, have to uh, think seriously about their future. And now, when we see this debate, even in the morning, I must say that if you make out of Iran a bogey, and not, I mean, I'm not defending Iran, uh, and not recognizing that it has uh, a very legitimate security interest. It had mm -hmm. been attacked several times. It is being threatened and not recognized. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, by, by others, including, by the way, by, unfortunately, by this present administration, because the previous move towards a much more um, wise policy, then you will have problems. Of course, you could have uh, destabilized Lebanon in order to create a problem for Iran, but then Iran will have uh, a few other means. You have to understand that other states, including Russia, United States, Will not be will, t will not take responsibility for your security Timur, any, anymore. Do you agree with Sergey, or do you think that Russia will fill a void in these countries if America disengages? Well, uh, I think it's, it's very important. You can question. disagree with I, him. It's okay. No, uh, I, ju ah. I just I just want uh, to give some concrete information. It is very important to look at these two countries. Why? Because we. Uh, uh, 
we will witnessing the elections in both of them next year right. uh, in uh, Iraq parliamentary elections and uh, to Loya Jirga uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, so probably uh, the results will show us uh, the nearest future by discussing future today and so that will give us some uh, ideas what will be uh, in these countries how they will influence uh, the region but Afghanistan is very important uh, to Central Asia and Central Asia is, is influencing Russia meaning the immigration processes uh, meaning the integration, uh, economic integration, many things. And uh, if we take Iraq, you cannot um, uh, solve the Syrian crisis without uh, having Iraq in mind, because it's, it's one region, Syria and Iraq. You can't just stop uh, at the Syrian border and decide that's right. okay, so all is resolved. That means that um, Russia will pay strong attention to these countries, and uh, I think Russia will need uh, uh, consultations and discussions with uh, with other uh, countries Thanks. involved, e even external uh, players. Thank you. Rashid's question uh, reminds me of a small anecdote. Uh, I, I once had a discussion with a member of the policy planning staff of Chinese, of the China uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I asked them, what is China's grand strategy in the world? And he said, we mostly try to think about, he was joking, but I sort of think there was an element of truth, but we mostly think about how to keep America distracted in small Middle Eastern countries. <laughs> Life is good then. Uh, now, Hoda Husseini. Yeah, hi. Here. Here, here, here. Oh, greetings, Hoda. Yes. I want to ask, uh, Andre, you said that you are in a process of building a new political civil nation to last in Russia. Is this possible under President Putin? And then for Sergei, you said that you want to keep radicalism away of your borders. The same Iran is saying that they want to, to keep radicalism out of their borders. Do you think your interference, your policy, you and Iran in Syria will get rid of the radicalism or mm. if we can get rid of Daesh, we'll have another kind of Daesh and we'll keep having this right. trend. And for Paul, who, whose fault is it that the Russians managed to interfere, as you are saying, in the American elections, but they failed to interfere in Germany, in France? Were they smarter than you? Great. Okay, great. Uh, Andre. Uh, mutatis, <clears throat> mutantis, as um, ancient said, um, um, changing and changing one. It's a situation inside Russia. And of course, it's a not easy situation for Russian president because he must be president of uh, in transition period, uh, in period when uh, a, a nation uh, uh, is trying to find uh, hierarchy of values, to recognize itself, to, uh, to build a, a, a self attitude, uh, um, uh, to uh, to create new identity, because not only, of course, uh, 85, 86 percent of Russian populations are Russians, but uh, it means that uh, 14 not Russians, and uh, uh, it's, it's a serious challenge for uh, governance, for Russian government uh, uh, to help people to find their new identity, new Russian identity. Uh, which uh, can, can uh, um, allow all people to find uh, this new, new identity, excuse me. And um, it seems to me that uh, uh, um, Russian president uh, uh, deliberately uh, tried to, to, help, uh, uh, to help a new generation of Russians, uh, new generation, to, to get uh, more uh, power, wealth, and so on and so on. I, mentioned, I have mentioned uh, that 40% uh, uh, of core of Russian governors and new people. And uh, uh, it, 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 it was impossible without uh, president help. No, uh, it seems to me uh, uh, today Russian uh, government uh, generally very, very smart. Right. Very smart and very serious. Uh, and um, um, we uh, don't uh, underestimate them. They have strategy policy. They are looking for partnership everywhere. 
and um, just uh, you asked me about so-called so common project. I think there are uh, uh, two. First of all, we have a terrible problem with gap of knowledge in contemporary world. Mm -hmm. Second problem, we have a problem with navigation in information ocean because a lot of fake news and so on and so on. Right. Maybe we need a sort of journalistic renaissance, if you like. Mm. Uh, and maybe it could be the uh, point for common discussions and maybe for common projects. I would agree. I mean, just very quickly, because I think it's important when uh, I just read the readout of, of uh, uh, President Trump's meeting with President Duterte in the Philippines, and Duterte called the traveling press spies. I really appreciate your comments because I have to tell you that there's a denigration of media around the world globally. Our own U.S. president is not helping. I have worries about the press and media inside Russia, uh, inside China, inside just across the world. So I just want to put a punctuation point on my own, like chairman's prerogative, that those of us who are in countries understand that the system does not work without a healthy, as you said, a renaissance in journalism. So gold star for you. Uh, Sergey, really, we're going to try to get to other questions, but Sergey, really quickly, your comments and reaction. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, first of all, about the radicalism. Uh, radicalism uh, is, uh, has local roots first. Right. It has been grossly exacerbated uh, by intrusion of foreign powers. Mm -hmm. I mean, which, uh, brought uh, Libya to collapse, Iraq to collapse, nearly Egypt mm -hmm. uh, to collapse. So uh, what we are, what Russians are doing, we are re-establishing uh, legitimate governments and uh, we shall support legitimate gov governments in other areas, whether we like them or not, first. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, if Russia would not have sent its troops uh, not troops, but um, uh, aviation uh, to Syria. In four months, according to our calculations, Syria would have been overrun by Daesh and Al-Nusra. And you would have had in the whole area, and not speaking in the whole Mediterranean, a different reality. Uh, with with a, a huge country, with military arsenals, uh, with communication uh, facilities, with even with a fleet mm -hmm. under the control. Right. Uh, so we did what we could, of course, and I think uh, uh, it is not ideal, uh, but uh, what we also did there, and that is that we stopped the unbelievably stupid and irresponsible uh, policy of uh, color revolutions, which inflicted disaster on many areas in the world, including on Ukraine. Right. Russia, uh, Paul, the, the question to, to reframe is, is, is Russia hit the bonanza in the American election, didn't get far in Russia and, or France and Germany? Uh, were we dumb? Well, let, let me say a couple of things, uh, but I'll try to be very fast. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is I, I think there are a number of unanswered questions about Russia's election interference in the United States. Uh, first and foremost, was it centrally directed uh, or not? And uh, what was the objective? Right. Uh, the second thing I would say is uh, if we uh, assume that the objective of Russia's election interference was try to try to get beneficial outcomes for Russia, uh, I would say that it was a demonstrable failure mm. uh, and, uh, uh, but, but because there's been a huge backlash in the United States and I, I think it's set the, the U.S.-Russia relationship uh, back uh, quite far. Uh, so, uh, following an experience like that, uh, if I were uh, involved in undertaking those policies in the Russian government, I, I'd be quite cautious about where else I tried it. Thank you. Agreed. Uh, 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 I'm sorry? Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I think we did not interfere, for, uh, but we got, I mean, the negative a response, I mean, for all kinds of other reasons. As I have said at the beginning, I hope that we did something there, because uh, otherwise it would be, I mean, uh, simply a fantastic disaster as we got into, I mean, trouble without anything, I mean, getting anything, even pride out of it. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, Assad <laughs> al-Shamlan. Uh, my question is Great. to uh, Mr. Saunders. Uh, he made, I think, a very interesting uh, distinction between the president and the policy establishment, uh, where they will 
uh, diverge uh, on the same issue. Sometimes they oppose each other. Uh, th their views will oppose each other on the same issue. Now, this seems to me to go even further than Russia. Uh, much of the talk we hear today about the unpredictability or inconsistency of uh, U.S. policy towards the Gulf actually stems from the experience of the Qatar uh, uh, crisis. Uh, now, my question to him is, I mean, if, if we look at the experience of the past year, it seems that the president, in the end, he follows the establishment rather than being able to carry the establishment to his views. And even in Russia, we can, we can detect some of that. But let's say if I am here, uh, uh, an observer in this part of the world, and want to ask your advice about when I try to foresee American policy, whom should I put more weight on, mm -hmm. the president or the policy establishment. In the Qatar crisis, we have the president saying right. something, and then the policy establishment, all of them actually, the State Department, the Pentagon, and the, the CIA had a, a rather different uh, uh, point of view. And today we are in a kind of equilibrium. We don't know exactly who is making the policy. Thank, thank but, you, Assad. Uh, what will you be advised there? Thank I would you. say thank you, Assad, and your question is the question I, that we are all asking. And so, uh, the, this is a very heavy responsibility, Paul. I, I, I think yeah. this is really a, a central question, and, and I would answer it in uh, several ways. Uh, first of all, the president is the president, uh, and uh, as long as he is in office, uh, that gives him a considerable weight uh, over U.S. foreign policy. Uh, at, at the same time, however, uh, the president, uh, as is well known, has no uh, prior government experience or, or foreign policy experience, and I think came into office without a uh, ready ability to differentiate between the, the various schools of thought inside the establishment uh, and w without a, a clear uh, vision of his own in foreign policy extending beyond uh, a, a set of uh, four or five particular issues that were of, of special interest to him. Uh, and the result of that has been that uh, the president did not really make personnel choices uh, that lined up with his stated preferences during the, the campaign. Uh, and at the same time, he has been actually, especially at the State Department, quite slow uh, in filling positions. Uh, I think not understanding that the, the first uh, victim, actually, of the failure to fill those positions is his own administration and his own ability to enforce his preferences uh, on, on the bureaucracy. Uh, so uh, I, I think that has, is what has contributed to the situation in which the president uh, has a number of uh, priorities or, or preferences on, on certain key issues. Mm -hmm. And if he really focuses considerable attention on a specific issue, uh, he, he may be able to enforce his preferences on that issue. Uh, but he can't focus on uh, uh, every issue all the time. Uh, and, and as a result of that, I think we have a situation in which the, the uh, uh, Republican part, uh, or the, I would say the mainstream Republican part of the foreign policy establishment uh, is uh, uh, actually in a fairly strong position uh, to, to shape uh, many elements of our foreign policy, again, unless the president specifically focuses on that issue over an extended period of time. Yeah, I'm just gonna jump in here. I think it's such an important question. Uh, there is a new movie coming out probably in January and February called The Final Year. Uh, and it's, in, it's sort of an insider's account following around 
Obama's team in the last year of its foreign policy, focusing on Susan Rice, John Kerry, Samantha Power, and Ben Rhodes. And, and in it, you know, you see that, that while they were rushing in that final year to push a lot of things, including John Kerry very uh, uh, focused on a Russia relationship and focused on trying to get to a deal on Syria, what's really interesting is the moment that Trump won, there's a segment in there where Ben Rhodes, uh, one of Obama's advisors, was speechless. He could, it, they, it was this long segment in the film where he literally couldn't speak because he knew the consequences were that people would pretend that the president's advisors and secretaries would matter. But he said, the bottom line is that no one backstops the president of the United States. The president of the United States makes hundreds of decisions each week. And the president, Trump, will be making hundreds of decisions. So it's something to keep in mind when this is, this is uh, asked, is that, that uh, and, and the Iran deal is the perfect example, where every single one of the president's major national security advisors advised him not to decertify the Iran deal, and he bucked them all, and he decertified the Iran deal. So it just, I think there are a lot of illusions about whether Trump's tweets matter or don't matter. They do matter, because they've said their policy, and Trump has been willing to buck all of his advisors and go his own way. So it's very important not to have illusions uh, right now. With that, we're going to go to Mohammed Al Alaki. Yes, so far here. So my question is: uh, Sanaa is under the control of the Houthi for two years, yet Russia is very comfortable to send a diplomatic mission there and stay there. On the other hand, they meet the president, the legitimate president Hadi. When I see this scenario and compare it to other scenarios in Syria and other in the Middle East. I questions, you know, is it Russia looking for partnerships and friends or a bargaining tool for a bigger game that we are not aware of, maybe Ukraine or Asia Pacific? So right. what is it? So I'm going to ask you to reframe your question just real simply as a question. So the question is, we have irrational behavior here. In one hand, you are with the rubble-controlled city, you have diplomatic mission there in Sana'a, on the other hand, you meet with the legitimate president. So are we a tool for a bargain, or are we friend? So, Sergey, Yemen. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we are not friends, we are friendly partners, and we are here. Uh, and we couldn't move uh, out of this area. Uh, we moved and what happened is uh, I mean, further collapse. Uh, probably Americans, in principle, could get out of the area because they're, uh, they're relatively independent. We couldn't get out of it. Uh, so, but if you believe that Russia will take uh, upon the responsibility of solving all of your problems, no. First of all, that it is impossible. Uh, second, uh, we, could, uh, we are not willing to uh, spend, I mean, a uh, huge amount of our political and uh, human capital on that. If we could help, be that in Yemen, and we are trying to help in Yemen, keeping, a, for example, even an embassy uh, uh, in the Yemeni ca capital, and an ambassador uh, with a government in exile in the Saudi capital, and we're trying to uh, help in a way uh, out and uh, offering humanitarian aid, we could help. But if, you, if somebody believes that we will get into one more war, well, uh, I, I'm not sure well, we shall be ready. Syria uh, was a very special case. I mean, it was close to our borders. We knew that about 10,000 of our uh, bandits are fighting there, the radicals, whomever they call them. Uh, we wanted to... Uh, kill them as much as we could possibly, and we knew that if, if Syria blows up, I mean, there will be no uh, firewall between uh, on the, uh, or on the uh, way of uh, uh, radicals going north. Uh, but we could not. Uh, but we are not going to involve I, I, ourselves in it everywhere. Paul, Paul has a thirty-second intervention, and we're right near the end of our session. But I want to ask you, Sergey and Timur and Andre, just really quickly, fifteen seconds each. Were you surprised by your success in Russia? Because many of us thought, "Wow, Russia is going to be taken down by overinvesting in in Syria." But were you surprised by your success or no? Uh, uh, in 1913, when uh, we were nearing a confrontation with the West, I read. 
uh, reread uh, War and Peace, and I was struck by a phrase, those who decide to win, win. <laughs> Very good. Andre, quick, any quick reaction, Andre, on, on Syria? No, I'm not surprised. I'm not, not surprised. surprised. I'm not surprised. Not surprised. Uh, it, 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 it was clear before. Uh, uh, Russian spring. Mm, Timur, surprised? Not surprised. Not uh, surprised? Do you I guys think Russia, ever, Russia, Russia was uh, very well prepared for the uh, intervention into this crisis uh, from different points. From Paul, the, surprised, not surprised? Well, uh, I, I would back up a little bit right. uh, to, to what extent has Russia succeeded because mm. the situation isn't over yet. Right. Uh, and, and that really raises the broader point actually that I wanted to make in response to what Sergei said about Yemen and, and also some of his other comments. It, it'll be very brief. Uh, Sergei has said a number of times what Russia is not prepared to do or, or won't do. Uh, and, and I think uh, from my point of view uh, that uh, uh, makes quite clear as we think about a regional order, uh, much less uh, a world order, uh, that Russia is quite interested in contributing to an order or being part uh, of the order, but not designing, leading, creating, managing uh, the, the order. Uh, and uh, 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 I, sometimes we forget that uh, in Washington, but I, I think it was uh, said uh, quite clearly by Sergey here. So I want to say in conclusion, I don't know if we've answered all the questions about the lenses. Maybe we have broken lenses now <laughs> as opposed to clearer lenses or old lenses. Uh, but I want to very much thank Sergey Karaganov, Dean of the Faculty of International Economics and Foreign Affairs at National Reach University Higher School of Economics. Paul Saunders, Executive Director of the Center of National Interest. Andrei Brzezinski, Chairman of the Board of the Foundation for Development and Support of the Vidal Discussion Club in Moscow. And Dr. Timur Makhmatov, Deputy Director of Programs, Russian International Affairs Council. And of course, thanks to Epson Ekebi, which we have to thank all the time uh, for her wonderful conference. And thank you all very, very much for a great session. <laughs>